Whoa, whoa, whoa! Calm, calm down there. Come, you know, guys, let's just let's just put up our feet. You know, yeah. I don't know if you can see this. Put your hair down. Let's just put the shake your hair feather. This is this is my vibe coming into season two. Um, I'm being told to put my feet down. Uh, so I'll clean. I'll clean. I'll clean that up. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Serious. Sorry. Serious. Pen is getting yelled at. You can't hear it because they're behind the glass. But but yelled. yeah. There's Epic. a team. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. it's one guy. His name's Brendan. <laughs> He's furious. No, there's a team. <laughs> they represent the beast. And we're doing their dirty work for them. We're in the belly of the beast. Yeah, welcome to season two. Uh, coming to you live from the colon. <laughs> No. <laughs> it's pretty good. We can edit from there. We can we can we can we can go on to something else. Guys, what's uh, what's 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 on topic? What's happening in the news? You guys want to get political? No. <laughs> never. Definitely no, not. Never. But we are so excited to be back with you guys. I am so happy to be back. I've missed you guys. I've missed interacting with our listeners. I've missed recording with these two folks. Mm-hmm. And I'm so happy that we're in person today. Yeah, me My too. heart's full. I it's know. much better. It's so nice. Otherwise, we're just getting into fights all the uh, time. Seriously. Fight, fight, conflict, fight. Conflict, 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 like, conflict. If Penn and I are fighting, Nava's yelling, fight, yeah. fight, fight. fight. <laughs> I'm, I'm instigating most of the... I'm spreading misinformation. Yeah. Whatever I can do to create toxicity between mm-hmm. Penn and Sophie. Because yeah. it's good for TikTok. Yeah. Toxicity is good for TikTok. Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're your hosts. I'm Penn. I'm Nava. And I'm Sophie. And I think we would have been your middle school besties. Which means we're just waiting to sell you drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. We're not going to use that one. Let's, uh, let's, uh, can we please move on to our guest because we're running out of time mm-hmm. and we're running out of attention span. <laughs> we're running out of ad buyers' money. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, today we've got Ed Spaliers, who is an English actor. You might know him from uh, some of his massive shows like Downton Abbey. He played he played James Jimmy Kent. He's on Outlander, where he played the antagonist, the awful antagonist, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Stephen Bonnet. Uh, you might know him from Aragon, which was his first role, which we get into. Uh, it was a huge franchise back in the day. Uh, he played Aragon. Also, Star Trek. He plays, I think, a role that is a bit of a... Similar, it's like a reveal spoiler that we can't talk about. I think this is what I recall him saying. So it's mm-hmm. a very, very major role in Star Trek, uh, which you'll be seeing. Most recently, Ed's talents have brought him to a role on my show, You, where he plays Reese! Reese! <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> That's great. Uh, Ed's, Ed's a legend. We love having him on. Uh, stick around, and we'll be right back. Ed, thank you for flying all the way (laughs) just for this interview and putting your kids, taking them out of school. (laughs) I'm just, I'm just stunned. Yeah. Well, it shows how much you mean to me, Ben. (laughs) (laughs) It is really nice to see you. It's been a little bit. It's been a while. Yeah. I mean, it hasn't been a huge amount of time, but uh, I, uh, it's funny, isn't it? Because I, I I don't speak out of turn here, but you you go and do a, a job where you work really intensely with someone and sometimes you strike up strike up great uh, rapport, sometimes you don't. I, I've really, really, and I've, I think I've waxed lyrical about this, how much time and respect I, I have for you and how much I enjoyed our, uh, our, our process, I suppose. Hmm. So hmm. genuinely I feel bowled over with honour to be, to be sitting here with all of you today because, you know, I, I know how passionate you are about all this and how great it is so yeah i'm uh yeah it's great to see you again yeah it's thanks, good to be here. that might have been the best reaction we've gotten yeah. here. Oh. over with honor and i feel like in particular what we what we had to tap into and what we were doing was a really interesting and 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 strange and almost risky process you know i mean the way you played reese I think was an immense challenge and you, Mm -hmm. I mean, you more than showed up and delivered. I mean, I I really do think it's like a standout performance of the whole, of the whole season. You know, I mean, I'm always there doing Joe and that's, that is what it is, (laughs) but but you know what that's like, you know what that's like, you know what it's like to just have to carry the whole scene and then me get all the credit. (laughs) (laughs) You do all the talking, all the, I mean, and how much talking. I mean, he did go on a bit. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We like to start now. Going back, uh, sort of as, as far as you're willing, so that we can just put a nice context around this formative time of life. Mm-hmm. 
adolescence. Maybe sketch us out a, a, a bit of early family life that led to the way you felt and the way that you were in middle school. I suppose, I, I mean, it's, I, I, that's, that was a formative time because the, the sort of school I was going to, 12, 13 is when you're about to um, make a change. So you go, you're about to go into mm -hmm. a, a secondary setup. For a lot of kids, it's around 11, but I, I, I happened to be at a very, very privileged school uh however i so i didn't belong there i i came from a very different background mm. uh so I, I think that was I, I was going to school with kids who were getting picked up in the flashiest cars in the world had all the money in the mm. world and i was i was i remember sometimes almost and it's it's horrific to think like this i was almost embarrassed to see how i was gonna be mm. picked up you know because mm. it was it would be clapped out old cars sometimes and all, all that kind of thing and I I I suppose going to a place like that from an early age you feel a sense of responsibility to do well in an environment like that because mm. I knew that my parents for better or for worse had found, found a way to put me through an education like this and and, and, and sort of sacrifice many many things and, and probably sacrifice things for the you know luxuries for themselves that I think maybe a lot of parents wouldn't these days maybe they would but I I, I, I so I, I did feel pressure mm. I felt pressure very early on in this in this world to to achieve it's, it's funny because I I, it, I I think I'm constantly caught between relishing that pressure and being resentful of it because I feel it's that pressure that's constantly driving me even now yeah ed i want to know a little bit more about your family life so you said you were feeling a lot of pressure and um, that made me wonder did you have siblings who were in the same position as you or were you an only child which could potentially make you feel even more pressure like you're the only one in this position what was your home life like? so i, I come from one of three okay mm -hmm. but uh the complexity is we are we all have different dads mm -hmm. we were all f all found ourselves going to these like I suppose they're not like they're not the, the higher echelons of elite school, but they're you know, private schools. But yeah. every single one of us had some form of scholarship or bursary to be there. Mm -hmm. That was just the decision that the parents made to make sure that that was the thing. Um, interestingly, at that at that middle school age, my brother had been there prior to me, and I think he'd struggled with certain teachers, and there'd been and some of those teachers were still there. So the minute I got there, they. Mm. They had it out for me for some for just for some reason of a, a pre you know pre existing yeah thing taking place. Are they much older? Or yeah, they, they are a lot older. Right. So yeah, a lot I of remember. that's why. I, so my the next one up. In fact, I was messaging him before coming in here today. He's like ten years older than me, and then the eldest is like seventeen years older than me. Mm. Wow. So, but we're all. We, to be fair, we've worked really hard to make sure we stay close because I think quite mm. often with half siblings and step siblings, it can be quite tricky to it is, form yeah. the bond. Yeah. But I, I have to, st I mean, that is, you know, one of the huge driving forces in my life is the fact that us three as brothers, we are incredibly close. Mm -hmm. And there is, of course, there's, there's elements that don't, don't work all the time and there's, yeah. there's opinions and things. But, you know, my, my, the next brother up in particular was in really influential in mm. a lot of my, my sort of creative outputs and certainly when it came to music and mm. film and, you know, he was... I mean, he showed me Terminator 1 when I was five, which is probably a little bit... <laughs> I mean, these days, that's standard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly. That seems a bit much. Stranger Let's things. Let's not endorse you know? it on the podcast, <laughs> yeah. though. Maybe wait a little longer. Um, so, but yeah, he's... You know, he, he, I've got a lot a lot of time and, and love... Well, both my brothers, but yeah, he's, he, he was definitely a, a big shining light growing up. Because mm -hmm. you know, there were things that, were, that happened at home that weren't always great. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I, you know, I've, I have to give a lot, of, a lot of space to him and how he tried to protect me nurture me and uh, you know and, and and do the big brother thing mm -hmm. it's interesting you say that he he sort of nurtured the maybe the artist in you mm. um is he is he an artist he's, he's not right he's he, i mean he's he's a very creative soul fiercely intelligent guy much like yourself pen um he is he Sorry, I give them looks. Give them like, see, I am intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so stupid. Sorry. Uh, I'm waiting for proof. I <laughs> yeah, he was. I didn't go to school, did I? Sorry. He um, uh, he worked in the music industry for years. Oh, okay. Um, DJing, okay. promoting things. Oh, so that's very much in in the world. Uh, yeah, completely. Okay, okay. And he's wanted to make films for a long time, and yeah, okay. he's he, in fact something he's, he's aspiring to do at the moment. But okay. uh, yeah, he's he's 
yeah, a, a very creative soul. When did the art start speaking to you, and and when did that start to become more than just like a hmm, you know, curiosity or a hobby? I think really early on, mm-hmm. like, like uh, <laughs> my mum's got some ridiculous notion that she was in a amateur dramatic play and I was pregnant with me and she felt me kicking. She was like, "Oh, he's going to be an actor." Wow. Which is, uh, it's, yeah. it's a bit. A bit yeah, I, I mean, it's a very sweet story, it, but yeah. yeah but, uh, or is it real? Is that exactly what you happened? Can, you came then? out with jazz hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little far from the truth. Oh, yeah. So bad in the world. Uh, um, he, so, but I think very early on, I was quite. I was given chances to do. You know, I, 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 I think any opportunity that came my way at school or a preschool to do any any sort of little production, hmm. I got into it very quickly. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And that became, you know, talking about that age from about, I'd say that carried through until about 10. And then I, when I was at this particular school, I was given the chance to play Puck in Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm-hmm. I was only 10. Yeah. And I <laughs> I, I just remember loving the feeling of being on stage and, yeah. and, and, and having everyone sort of in the palm of your hand in yeah. in a in the sense of a 10-year, however a 10-year-old yeah, sure. can have that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and enjoying, and... and uh, and, and enjoying that, I think it was an attention thing to start with. As far as we're aware, on Wikipedia, we did a bit of our research. You, you, did you, did you write a play? Because you never, uh, I feel like we, we, we had a lot of conversation. Can I actually on set. read you the Wikipedia entry? We can erase this if you don't feel comfortable, but it's it's written in such a like tantalizing <laughs> way. Yeah, so it says Spilliers wrote a play that was performed at Eastbourne College in Sussex, where he attended. Extraordinarily controversial. Retribution dealt with the subject of pedophilia and was met with stunned reactions. <laughs> Done Tell us about this, Ed. Yeah, so please, please, honestly. <laughs> uh, so when you're uh, between the age of 14 and 16, you study for something called your GCSEs in the mm-hmm. UK. So if you do drama, you have to uh, devise a piece. Or you can either devise your own piece or you have to do, uh, like, take a written piece and, and sort of reenact it and everything. Um, we, my friends and I, there was three of us, decided to devise a piece around pedophilia uh, in... And in particular, in um, sort of young offenders institution, institutions, mm-hmm. it was kind of taken from inspiration. From do you ever? There was a book, and then it was turned into a film called Sleepers. Do you remember that film? Yeah, no, With that Brad movie Pitt was very scarring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Kevin Bacon. Do you remember that movie? Yeah. yeah, and I was. I don't know. As a teenager, I was fascinated by that film. It was with, like, priests, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it is based mm. on true story. you got Rob yeah, De Niro. I mean, yeah. it's an all-star cast. Everyone's in it. Yeah. Um, Brad Renfro is the kid. Brad yeah. Renfro, man. Yeah. Wow. And it was also, there was a, a Ray Winston film. I think that was what his first, his, like, breakout performance was in a thing called Scum, which is a different idea, but in, a, in a, an institution. So we, we, we thought that would be a good thing to explore, and we pretty much improvised the whole thing, and it was... Improvise. Oh, well, wow. we st- improvising. Well, we improvising a play about pedophilia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not I mean, sure yes and works there. The same way. <laughs> I, I mean, there's no way Dicey. it would be happening in school anymore. I know it's bad, isn't it? Um, so, yeah. What was controversial about it? Was it just that it was a taboo topic, or did you was the point you were making controversial? It was quite violent. It was. Mm. It was. Uh, I suppose for a school exam piece. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like and, quite and what, sexually what explicit, and like it was not. Yeah, it was. We got a really good grade, though. So I mean, yeah, well, there you <laughs> like, go. Like, it was marked. It was ambitious. But it, it was very. Amb- it was very ambitious. It was controversial. So you improvised the violence and the sexuality. Yeah, I mean, that, that, no, that was state. Like that, we we, we oh. re- obviously oh. we rehearsed that, and that was okay. that was choreographed, and and the the one kid in particular who's still a very good friend. So you know he couldn't be that badly affected by what yeah. we put together. Uh, <laughs> um, he, uh, you know, we, we, yeah, it, yeah. Th- there were a few times where we had to sort of like there was some. Oh God, I can't believe I'm saying this. There were some beatings that like didn't quite work out, and like we yeah. actually hit him on the shins. But I was like, you know, I'm oh. now, I know. But having now worked in the industry, I've yeah. worked. I mean, that kind of happens when you're. It does. Yeah, yeah we always get, get bruises and yeah. cuts. Yeah. I know. Also, like teenage kids are knocking about, always getting up to mischief. So at least we were trying to do something creative. Too. Yeah. Hmm. No, I think it's laudable. <laughs> Can I just ask one more question on this one? Was your were your parents in the audience? I think my mum would have been because my mum never really missed anything. Do you remember how she reacted? She, uh, she's like, I mean, I can, uh, I, I mean, there's, I, uh, she's the best critic I've got because mm. she never ever puts me. I'm like, mum, you got, you you got to be a bit more objective <laughs> like than what you're doing at the moment. Like, please, yeah. 
Mm. So, uh, no, but there was a lot of, you know, a lot of our peers were, and other teachers were. And I remember them just, because it was quite a, you know, uh, uh, a hoi polloi mm. sort of school. Everyone mm. was uh, very, oh, no, it's very, it's very good. No, no, it's very good, Edward. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. So good. Really challenging what you did. <laughs> You're pushing the boundaries, weren't you? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> That's so good. Okay, I, we'll move on from middle school in a minute, but I do want to ask a couple of questions that we always ask our guests on Podcrushed. One of them being, what were your experiences around love and heartbreak at this time? Um, good question. So that, uh, I suppose in middle school, that age, <laughs> I think my interactions were quite strange. I remember I was doing, I, I remember I was doing a play outside of school. I was doing uh, Bugsy Malone, outside, like a, nothing to do with school, like in a, in a group production thing. Uh, and there was a girl there that I really, 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 fancy but I couldn't I could not bring my I think maybe because I went to all boys junior school I just yeah. couldn't bring myself to talk to her mm -hmm. however this is going to sound really creepy however I always had the guts to phone her up mm. and I could phone her and like use a payphone in the school like boarding house and I used to put all my money into this payphone to speak to her and I talked to her for like an hour hour and a half Aww. every night like the kids are like wow. oh that's well that's not creepy you're oh, talking no, it's, yeah. maybe it's just maybe it's not <laughs> are creepy. you leaving a message Ed yeah <laughs> 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 I haven't heard back from you yet. Yeah. <laughs> but I could, but every then you know we'd have and these. And she great... wouldn't talk to you either in person. No, I think she would have. She just mm -hmm. no, she was silent on I the other end. I think she was expecting me to come up to her. She was a year yeah, older. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, she, so she was, was she was playing into tropes. Yeah. <laughs> she was playing into the idea that you needed. No. Yeah, I, I think well, you're right. I, I think that you know maybe true. back then maybe maybe. Yeah. But also, uh, yeah, I just remember being so petrified to go and talk to her and like almost sweating in rehearsals mm -hmm. but then also desperately wanting to go and talk to her i mean that sort of check that yeah so that that relationship didn't mm -hmm. last obviously yeah <laughs> and then sorry se um you know secondary school it changed a little bit i suppose because yeah. i was suddenly in an environment where there was there was girls there was well there was women they were up to 18 so it was like yeah. it was a whole new did thing. you have any notable heartbreaks yeah by, by someone who was a couple of years older than me uh, yeah it was um it's quite raw because mm -hmm. uh, I think she was still in love with one of the the like, all the all singing all dancing sports heroes of the of the school the other question that we always ask our pod crush guests about middle school is do you have any embarrassing stories readily available oh. about that time uh, I don't oh, we'll no. take an embarrassing story from any moment of your life if, you, if it <laughs> yeah. doesn't oh my come goodness. from middle embarrassing school. stories <laughs> yeah I'm not very good at it. Maybe I try and push all these things yeah. away. Yeah. Do you get embarrassed? Let's yes, talk about, I, mean, I get embarrassed that. all the time. I get I, I, I have a real, uh, I have a huge chip on my shoulder about many things. <laughs> Just pick one. Yeah. Just pick one. <laughs> no, but, but <laughs> they're, they're not necessarily, they're not just things that embarrass, but because I, 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 I thought the embarrassing thing would come up and I was like, oh, what, what have I been embarrassed by? Where, when have I, hmm. that's bad, isn't it? That maybe I don't wear them, no. wear, 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 wear them front and center that i can't think of a particular memory that is making me go oh that's that was that was an awful moment i think i've had <laughs> i think i've had more traumatic things happen to me yeah than embarrassing yeah. things Aww. embarrassing is hard it's like it has to be kind of trivial i mean maybe not trivial but but yeah it can't you know traumatic feels like a different a different thing sadder yeah. mm -hmm. experience yeah we it's... wouldn't ask you to share your most traumatic <laughs> 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 that's yeah. another podcast well, we have we just can come back crushed. to that one yeah <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I'd have okay. to. I've got. I've, I've got to think about embarrassing things. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm sorry. That's fine. No, so so actually, to me, Sophie's actually very relieved. She has a hard time thinking of embarrassing yeah. things, and she's. The, you're the first person who hasn't been able to think of one. So <laughs> yeah, it's hard. They're she's hard to remember. Me. They're hard to pinpoint. I'm in good company. Ed, we're gonna get into your career in just a moment, but I wanted to ask you, your father. You mentioned when you came in, you talked. You were talking about your kids, mm. and I just wanted to know how you feel that becoming a father has changed your life or impacted your life. I, I feel that I look at the world so differently, which I, I'm sure is, that's a theme that comes up time and time again with people once they, you know, mm. encounter parenthood. I feel that I, I, I'm so sensitive to, to things happening to other people. I used to be a lot more, I, I definitely mm. used to be a lot more aggressive in, in life mm. and even towards others as well. I, and I, I feel that that has shifted. Mm. I'm certainly protective of my own, but I feel that I, I have a lot more empathy of, for the world in a way that I didn't possibly before. Mm. 
Can can you just share a little bit more? Because I, I love hearing people talk about how becoming a parent increases their creativity. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. sometimes we might associate it with the opposite. Can you share just a little bit more about that? Well, I think you are only a you know a heartbeat away from some sort of emotion spilling out of you because it's, you know mm-hmm. ch- ch- children from the moment I remember from the moment both my son and my daughter both of them when they were born just the emotion that pulled out having seen this witness this process and witness what my girlfriend was able to to do mm. you're like, how on earth is that possible and then mm. that just that emotion never leaves you what i mean don't get me wrong it also means my my anger emotions are also just like <laughs> also simmering right as well like my daughter is a firecracker and she keeps me on my toes at all times I, th- I feel that your your personal emotions your own emotions are just at your fingertips so much more because mm. you're i don't know if it's your it has to come down to love I just watch these two and they and they are fulfilling that all the time. And also beyond like just creativity, they they are the they're, they're my driving force. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're the, they are the reason that you know they're the reason I'm sat here talking today, you know, all these yeah. things. It's not really it's not about me anymore. I just want to highlight something you said cuz I I haven't quite heard it this way and I think it's really profound. You connected creativity to love, like the expression greater expressions mm. of creativity being connected to greater feelings of love. And I just want to put a highlight on mm-hmm. that cuz that's beautiful. Nava summarizes things actually with <laughs> it, she'll, she'll draw out the genius in what you just said. <laughs> I mean, that, I've never <laughs> heard my media genius put in the same, but <laughs> I'm going to take I'm thinking for that one. <laughs> I think it's really lovely also what you said about how your children have increased your empathy and and how you feel about other people. I don't have any children yet, but my sister has a daughter and she's pregnant with a second. And she has told me that, you know, before she loved kids, she would see children in public and think like, oh, cute, you know, like most of us do. But then after starting to raise her child and seeing, you know, the progression, the challenges that she goes through, the all of the emotions that she experiences her little idiosyncrasies and little cute things now when she sees another child in public she just has this like overflowing love because it's not just a child sitting on the bus yeah. next to her you know like she imagines that whole uh spectrum of that child's life and i think that probably extends to other human beings as well because everyone was a child at one point you know that's how i feel about dogs after getting a dog <laughs> but anyway well so it's true every time i see a dog i'm like God, you're so special. So I had it with dogs for years. I, I, I still get it with dogs. Yeah. But I think you can have that. Fi- I think it's yeah. just, it's yeah, just yeah, putting yeah. on someone. Well, what, you're, you, what you were tapping into there, Sophie, is I think like we should feel that kind of love for yeah. all people. Yeah. I mean, we really, like honestly, like when mm-hmm. we see somebody who doesn't have a, a, a home and is, mm-hmm. and is mm-hmm. forced to live on the streets, when, when we see somebody struggling with addiction, when we see somebody really in any kind of pain mm-hmm. that, is, that is notable, it, you know, it should break our hearts uh, mm-hmm. at least a little bit, and yeah. and I I I feel like the future of humanity is in um, the kind of love that we're able to tap into now with parenthood. I think all people, of course, have access to that. It's mm-hmm. just so that we know we. It's like it's like becoming a parent is like a fail safe way, right? Mm-hmm. And even then, by the way, lots of people sort code. of it might it might crack them for a second, but then they they yeah. wall up after. So mm-hmm. you know, that's true. But it's, it's 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 a love that's universally available to all of us. How about that? I like wow, that there too. we go. Uh, you was your first role in Aragon. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, moving on. Thank you for coming. <laughs> no, um, no, no, no. So wait, wait a second. So what were you like? Seventeen. Seventeen. Yeah. And wow. and uh, and uh, and it shows. Uh, <laughs> Well, it's yeah, your first know. role. What a That's major amazing. role! Yeah, it's huge. Oh, it's crazy. It, it is huge. I also want to tell you, I went out for that. I auditioned you for beat it. Him. You'd have been a lot better. <laughs> I don't think so. No, you know, you know what the feedback from the casting director was to my agent, and I have never gotten this before or after in my life. And it, it, it was warranted, but it, it also shows how long I'd already been doing it, and I was like so. I was not remotely prepared. I, I hadn't. I was like, this is a story about a dragon. Little did I know how popular dragons were going to become. Yeah. <laughs> um. I was the feedback pen put the cigarettes away don't put them out on your own arm yeah. it's a little disconcerting yeah. uh, no. freaks everyone out no no it, um, I also knew by the way I had a whole diatribe to my girlfriend before I was like it's gonna go to some British guy really um, and and a, British a, a, guy. a British guy I love no. uh, uh I I just probably gave one of the worst auditions in my life, least prepared, and the and the and the feedback that that the casting director gave. I don't know what the tone was. If it was admonishing, or if it was, she said, uh, he was so unprepared. It seemed arrogant. 
And mm. not arrogant, arrogant, just arrogant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it arrogant or arrogant? Do I have a chance? Did I get it? Are you yeah. saying I get it? Did oh, the well, arrogance must... work? <laughs> it's all a facade. <laughs> I'm miserable. <laughs> yeah. So that. So that was. Uh, yeah. And in fact, I yeah. didn't even recall that until I saw that you were arrogant. I was like, wait, is this the same arrogant? Yeah. So arrogant. I mean. it, must be, <laughs> it must. It must be the same arrogant. So that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, so so and, and again, this comes back to being at the. the that sort of down at Eastbourne and being at school where I I was given opportunities. So every time I was about to sort of veer off the straight and narrow, or if I did veer off the straight and narrow, I had this very pushy drama teacher. I also had this sort of personal tutor there who, who they just ground me in doing a production. They'd always constantly have me doing something that was, you know, like creatively st- stimulating. That's great. It was, re- it was really cool. And one particular teacher, the, the head of drama, who was an actor himself, he kept putting me forward because he had connections to the industry. He kept putting me forward for uh, film auditions, and there'd been two or three. Like the Narnia series was one franchise I went up for. Got quite close on that, and then not close enough. But anyway, uh, and then um, I think the Hannibal Rising was another one as well. Uh, and then this, yeah, this audition came up, and I I, th- I remember doing like two tapes, and I was all set to be like going on a uh, a rugby tour to Argentina with my school. So that's what I thought I was doing. And my dad, even to this day, is still like, well, you should have been going on a rugby tour. That's what you were supposed to be doing. Ed, I mean, to be fair, you sound like you were very cool. You, you, you've never mentioned that you played rugby. Like, <laughs> yeah, at that, that that's level. an embarrassing story in itself. Yeah. <laughs> All right. He only gets better. Yeah. Ed's embarrassing story is like being too good at two yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I literally am golden. <laughs> yeah. I shine yeah. everywhere, and it becomes embarrassing. <laughs> it's embarrassing for you guys. That's yeah. what I yeah. mean. Yeah. I mean, no, I'm embarrassed. I am embarrassed at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to just keep dropping those in there as well yeah, as we yeah, go. Yeah, no, um, yes, this and it came up, and it it was a completely surreal scenario. I, I, it, it was the one thing I, I'd wanted more than anything, but suddenly I was going to be like sent off to Eastern Europe for seven months as a 17 year old and it was weird because I was at that age where I wasn't young enough to where a chaperone was required mm. yeah but I wasn't quite old so I was was quite, wasn't quite old enough so they can't do like full like adult hours kind of thing so I was in this weird I was just in this weird limbo yeah. where I was basically given free reign and in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe. <laughs> As a guy who was already a little Golden bit... rugby player. <laughs> well, it was no, it was no, 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 no. Sorry, there'd be, yeah, there'd yeah, be a sorry, few no, friends at school who would definitely be scoffing at that right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm um, sure. They, um, I, yeah, it was, it was, but I was already a kid that was, I don't know, sometimes I was, I was, you know, I, I, I found myself getting in trouble at school. Mm. And so to take that kid and put them in Eastern Europe with complete free reign and liberty... Is a very on a film set. No on less. a film set, when yeah. you're surrounded by people who have, who you know are quite liberal in their yeah. approach to life, anyway. And you're number one on the call sheet, probably. Uh, right? Yeah, it opened up a and whole a giant new way of yeah. living life. Yeah. Did you enjoy that free reign, or did it feel like too much? I enjoyed it at the time, mm-hmm. but hindsight, what a wonderful thing it is, <laughs> has made me realize it was I was giving it too much. Mm-hmm. And I remember actually having a chat with my dad in a, in a square in Budapest, and there was a load of crew there. My dad's not an emotional man, although he, there's elements of him that are becoming more so as he gets older, but he he looked scared, and he told me he was scared. Before you went off? As I was just starting. Mm-hmm. And I'd mm-hmm. never had sort of seen him so honest about it. And as a 17-year-old, unfortunately, I wasn't prepared um and i wasn't uh, emotionally mature enough to handle that i kind of just mm-hmm. laughed it off and be like oh, dad mm-hmm. you know it's fine you know, I'm, you know and took a very rock and roll approach mm-hmm. and i wish i'd heeded his mm-hmm. his fear a little bit more what what was he i mean i think it's kind of clear broadly but mm-hmm. but what was he afraid of specifically in that moment for you i, I think he was af- afraid that i was going to be swept up into the TV film industry and potentially spat back out again. Mm-hmm. He was right. Just mm. for, he was definitely right. I think he was worried that I would be doing all the wrong things, you know, the drinking, all, 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 yeah, the things that you know, the 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 temptation that is put before you when you were well at, at many ages, but certainly yeah. as a young actor and you're starting out. 
And uh, don't get me wrong, I took the work very seriously even then, but I didn't have an I didn't have any grounding. Right. Yeah. Well, you were seventeen on a film set with no real parameters. No. It's a hundred million dollar movie. There's nothing. It's and pretty, it's like you're, yeah. Yeah. And that was when, they, by the way, that was like franchises were not as um, common as they no. are. True, like this yeah. really that that was a big. And that, that was why I was so unprepared for my audition. I'm like, I'm not gonna get this thing. <laughs> no, but no, but seriously, I mean, that was like, I just wanna, I just wanna appreciate that. That was, that was not. There are a lot more people who can re- who can relate now to that experience. I said, still a small number, but more people. Then I did feel like it was just not really a thing. And I wonder if now, if people have, there's much more of a support network that is probably is, is enforced. Yeah. And I feel that you know, I think both my parents just felt like they didn't know what you know what what they were supposed to do, and it's not their fault. And also, I was supposed to have this this one of these tutors I was talking about at my school come out and like keep my education up. That just went completely. Mm. So having been like going okay with with mm. certain things at school, that was just forgotten about. And it was like it was a huge opportunity. I got to work with some amazing people that don't and like the actual experience of making the film was was amazing. It was mind yeah. was mind blowing. But I it I I also struggled with it as it because it was really poorly received. Mm. Um. And when you're 17 and front and center, well, by and that your first time, role, uh, first role, and I was completely taken apart. The film was taken apart. I was Aww. taken apart. Oh, geez, that just seems it's it's just bru- I, evil. Just as an it's aside, cool. I have so many issues with the way that critics write reviews mm. because there's human beings at the center, and sometimes it feels like they're deliberately to, to get their views or whatever. They're like deliberately being like mean and like cruel in the assessments, and it's just so unnecessary, especially. If there's a child, like someone under yeah. 18 involved, there should be laws against that. And especially so in film and TV where mm. there are so many hands yeah. in what's being created yeah. and actually so little control belongs to one person alone. So true. And so what ends up happening is that the actors get skewered because yeah. yeah. they're the face of the project. It's true. But yeah, it just feels quite cruel. Yeah. So, Ed, what was it like to be skewered at 17? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, no, no. I'm kidding. I mean, in all honesty, I, I'm, I was still... You talk about us on set, and it comes back down to this thing of pressure. I mean, there was mm. huge pressure there, but then it... But I, 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 I completely went off the rails mm. on, on the back of it, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I was... It was, not, I was I basically kissed my career goodbye by the time I was 21, more or less. Oh, maybe. really? Wow. Yeah, I mean, way. I was just, I was all over the place. So how did you get back in? Was Downton Abbey the next commercial project? I th- that would be the next commercial project, but I, th- I feel there were two independent films that did before that that just, mm. they just put a bit of confidence back in. And mm. they, it became, I, I, it was about finding discipline, I suppose. Mm. I think a discipline is something I'd struggled with for a long time. Mm. I found a lot of it through running, weirdly, um, and I discovered that even more so on a couple of these these independent films. I just ran every day, and it's mm. very meditative for me. And um, which I know so many people say, but it really it it's been a big that was a big turning point, I suppose. Mm. Do you still run? Yeah, I still do quite a lot, not as much as I was. I was doing huge amounts during COVID, and like distances. That, it's, this is another embarrassing moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's not another; it's the first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's joking. No, he's, about to, he's about I'm to. I'm doing brag. the reverse of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're saying no. you're an incredible it's runner. You ran 17 miles a day. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> and also not running. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but th- that became part of it, and uh, I think yeah. So these those two little independent films I did, where I just enjoyed the process and got back on, and actually mm-hmm. felt like it was the first time since probably being at school I had confidence in my ability and then Downton did come along and that changed it yet again I suppose yeah I would assume that like projects like getting Downton Abbey for example that can you know feel affirming in one way as an artist but then on on the other hand being able to do more independent projects that have less of an audience that aren't tied to how they'll be received as much where you can just focus on the art and the reason that you probably got into it, the feeling that you have, the joy that you have when you're you're doing the art, are probably both necessary. Yeah, yeah. They d- I think they definitely are. Uh, I, I feel that, you, 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 and also you sort of can't really do one without doing the other anyway. Yeah. Um, but, and actually on Downton, as much as it was commercially huge success, and I had some great things to do in that show, I was also very much, it was a, it was a big, that was another learning curve because it was a place where I got to watch a lot. Mm. Rather than I wasn't necessarily I wasn't front and center, which is fine. But I was I, it was a, a place to absorb and and study, 
other people and how they responded. But I think, yeah, I, 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 definitely that you do need you need both because one gives you the confidence to do the other as well, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So is one of these films, uh, again, we did a, a little, just a tidbit of research. Is this Wale? To so Wale is something I produced. Oh, Okay. We should talk. Yeah. <laughs> it says worked on. It doesn't say started. Right. Okay. 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 So 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 hang on. It's a short film. Oh. Yeah. Ah. All right. Let yeah, me read the, the rest of this question then. <laughs> hang on. Just another one of my talents, you know, Pet. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you could uh, produce one of our uh, projects? Yeah. <laughs> so so from what I'm reading is that it centers on racial prejudices in the UK. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's, it's centered so uh, a very good friend of mine, Barnaby Blackburn, who uh, we've now he's written and directed, and I've produced with him uh, three shorts. This was the first. Uh, it centers around a young guy played by the wonderful Raphael Famatobi. I feel like I'm doing a pitch for it, even though we've uh, <laughs> just been made it already. Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, I'm so sorry. Well, you're gonna have to do this, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> always to he, um, support your craft. He is. Just coming out of a, a Young Offenders Institute, having done some time, and he's trying to rebuild his life. And it's, it's, it's exploring how difficult it is to do that in London, in inner city London, and, and the prejudices that people face. Uh, so he comes back out to be a... Um, he's trained as a mechanic, and he comes back out to be a mobile mechanic, and he meets this character who he thinks is going to be his first client and might even potentially be this sort of... You know, almost like an angel, so someone who's going to look after him and, and guide him. And, and it turns out that that guy is there to just completely uh, exploit him racially, essentially. Mm. Um, so we, yeah, we, and we wanted to look at, you know, we, we've shot that five years ago now, six years ago, maybe. So it was a, it's a time when there's understandably a lot of attention and a lot of heat in London, mm. uh, you know, about, you know, racial discrimination, exploitation, um, and we, th we just thought it was an important story to mm -hmm. tell. I would love to hear a little bit, sort of what, from your perspective, what are the biggest challenges facing achieving like total racial equality in a place like London? The polarizing views are becoming so extreme now. It feels like we're just going back in time, and I don't, mm. I don't understand I, I don't understand why it doesn't I don't I don't see why everyone's had to fight so hard for it for it to, I don't I, I, I just can't see the logic of how anybody thinks that's that's a good approach and I think what my my fear is that certainly in inner cities I suppose that if you come from a certain racial background that you're going to struggle because there isn't there isn't there isn't the attention on 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 where you are there isn't the investment on where you are and I feel that people are are, are, are gonna suffer as a result and I don't know why, but why can't we make it better? I don't know why we can't fight. I don't know. I just don't get the logic. I don't see why well, people... Well, yeah, I mean, look, I, the, the, the question is so hard to address, but it does feel to me like because we're addressing the problem as a, as, as a primarily material crisis, whereas the crisis is, is invisible, the things, the things that are withholding us from progress are not material. They're, they're you know, for the three of us hosting this show, we would refer to them as spiritual, but you could refer to them as... Um, Moral, philosophical, political, you know, somewhere in that realm. Because the things that are, the, the, the barriers in our way is not like, oh, there's not enough money to fill in the blank, you know, nor is there not enough time to fill in the blank. Um, it's just about will, you know. Uh, so, so, so to me, although I don't have an adequate answer to that great question, it, it's, it, it's at least that we seem to be attacking these problems as though, as though, um, Really, as though money will 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 solve the yeah. problem. Actually, I, you know, because again, I, for all of the incredible work that countless organizers like around the world in different ways are doing, like there's no doubt about that. Like there does need to be redistribution of wealth. There does need to be the generation of wealth in different communities. Like absolutely, it's of course like material well-being is one aspect that needs to be addressed. But without tapping the root of the problem, which is ultimately like actually an idea, like race as a social construct is an idea. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, there, you know, we're not, yeah, so I don't know. That's... Yeah, I also think it starts quite young. Like what we were talking about earlier, that that overflowing love that every person has the potential to tap into for other human beings. Mm. I think part of the reason we we don't have that, especially for people who don't look like us, is 
starts at school, like at a very mm-hmm. young age, especially in the U.S. Yeah, uh-huh. at home yeah. or, you know, most schools in the U.S. are quite segregated, not, you know, by law, but by by neighborhood. And so if people aren't living in integrated neighborhoods, then they're going to schools in 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 they're going to segregated schools, essentially. And they're growing up surrounded by other people who look like them and not getting to know and developing a love for a whole range of people. It's interesting because what I, my son, yeah, we haven't breakfast yesterday. My son, he's, he's, he's a fascinating little chap uh, and he's got <laughs> questions on everything. Yeah. And, and I don't have the brain power to answer him coherently, but I try. And he was saying, he was asking me, yes, was it? he said to me yesterday, we were talking about religion because he's studying something about Greek mythology at the moment. And then we moved on to religion and it was that whole sort of BC, AD thing. And, the, and then he was talking about religion in the UK and I st- about like, Christianity being quite prominent. I said, yes, it is, although I think it's starting to shift and Christian- Christianity in the UK is waning. And I think, I think I might, I may, you might have to fact check me on this, but I feel like uh, is Islam is actually the more prominent faith wow. now yeah. in, hmm, in the UK cool. and he was wow. like why but why dad but and I was trying to explain to him since the beginning of time we have been a country full of people immigrating mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that is forever evolving mm-hmm. and I was trying to explain to him that well, Christianity has been the, the, like, the strongest standpoint for such a religion for such a long time the main faith there but it's evolving because we've had so many different people coming from all around the world with their cultural ideas with their faiths mm-hmm. with their feelings and and coming in there. and i think and i was trying to say i think it's great that it's evolving and if Islam becomes a more prominent one for the next 400 years then, then so be it that's mm-hmm. that's cool but if it's bringing in you know these are saying that these people have you know if it's you know a couple of generations ago a family have arrived and then that next generation they're british and they they are feeding that in and, and britain has founded itself on being this melting pot of ideas and faiths mm-hmm. and beliefs and I think that's I think that's pretty cool. So I feel I feel that sort of taps into mm-hmm. I think sort of what you're saying, Sophie, in terms of where people you know where people come and what they're surrounded by. Mm-hmm. I was just quite curious to think my eight year old son was asking me the question, and I yeah. still don't think I gave him the a good enough answer because he looked at me and he was like, oh he, he didn't he looked unsure. Yeah, hmm. I think our political systems and our educational systems, like basically all the systems through which we organize ourselves are cast in the light of old beliefs about human beings, that some were better than others, you know, like basically caste systems everywhere, Mm -hmm. some formal, some informal, Uh, but basically the belief that some human beings are better than others and deserve more than others. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that is an antiquated view and and we are moving more and more towards the enlightened understanding that that's not true and that there's like essential oneness, but our systems absolutely do not reflect that and then actually reinforce these old beliefs so that there are some that still hold them. Um, so if you think about like an institution as a channel through which resources flow, those channels are definitely broken. Like what you're saying is right. They don't get to some places. Some places get way more than they need. So we also just like have to have new political systems <laughs> and and reform all of these systems to be in the light of the like understanding of oneness. And until we do that, we won't have material solutions. We won't have spiritual solutions. It's, it is inaccessible until you change systems to be really built in that light and in that understanding. In a way, we've complicated things beyond any kind <laughs> of yeah, reason. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And there is an inherent oneness to humanity that we all actually as children just feel and know, you know, before we've learned about race, before we've, you know, all, all these differences that we, that some are real, but some are magnified and some are just totally imagined. Um, and so I feel like the one of the greatest challenges of being a parent is like kind of taking all that you know all the complications about the world that you know are sort of set up mm. to obfuscate this some of these simple truths mm. and just be like you know like how do I say this to you right now how do I say this to you in a way that you'll understand that doesn't actually start to teach you about all these unreal complications you know, is that is that is what completely, I'm saying making sense? Completely, yeah, well, completely. Because the, the other question he asked me that they was what, what we were talking about. Uh, um, so my beloved football team in in London is Tottenham Hotspur. Yes, I know. <laughs> and one of our star players, who is like possibly the loveliest man in men's football, son, Hungmin son, yeah, who came on and scored in a great goal against West Ham the other day, was subject to racial abuse. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, Asia and my girlfriend and I were like, just like, how is, how is anyone racially abusing these people? Like these people? And it's, it's every team is doing it. Every fat, well, 
most group of fans try not to, but there's a, there's certain fans that seem to do it more than others. And my and it, we were talking about it in the car, and and my boy Jude was like, but Dad, what's racism? Mm. And like mm. I, I tried to explain, and he was again. He just looked. He was like, well, "What? What? Why? What, why? <laughs> like what? What? How does anybody like pre prejudging? And how? How? Where, where's that base? So, but that's incredible that an eight year old is so enlightened that it's absurd to him. Yeah, like yeah. that's also beautiful. It is. You it's know, amazing. That we're at that yeah. stage. Yeah. yeah. But, and it's such a shame that we have to have everything so affected as we go on in life. So, yeah. how do we? How do we reset it? I know it's a huge thing, but how? Mm. We're gonna figure that out. Today yeah, yeah. On podcast. different podcast though. That's gonna it's gonna be on our RSS feed. Okay. You guys tune in, YouTube, Sorry. like and subscribe. We'll be solving racism there. I want to actually move us on to you yeah. to talking about you, the project that you not guys me. worked on together. Our show. No, not you. Yeah. <laughs> but you. Let's go from race <laughs> to to Netflix's no. <laughs> I don't know. By the time this yeah. airs, who knows? Um, yeah, I want to jump into you. How did the role of Reese come onto your radar? Uh, so I was out here filming something else at the time, and I, my UK agent Rebecca is obsessed with the show. Oh, really? Mm. Obsessed. Um, I think she's delighted I'm here today. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Rebecca. <laughs> um, Maybe we could call her Beck. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> Hello, Beck. She basically said, if you, I mean, not, not quite, she would drop me if I didn't do it. But she was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I have been working, Rebecca. <laughs> like, like me, you're like, I'm on Star Trek, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she made it pretty clear. She's like, I think this would be a really great, it'd be a really great move. And I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do some, I'll do some, I'll do some digging, I'll do some research. Reese search. Mm. Um, oh dear. <laughs> yeah. We love that on this show more. more. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, to be honest, it, it felt like a, I, I had to do it based on what. You, you don't often get full scripts when you tape or audition. You probably don't know what taping or auditioning is, and you haven't probably haven't done it for 20 odd years. What else have I done? What else have I done that, that, that leads you to believe that? I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but so often you don't really, you, you seldom get a script. So if you get sides, it's so hard to work out what this part's all about yeah, unless you... Yeah. So true. It's, it's, it says like literally boy or girl or man. Oh or gosh, woman. It's, you could take yeah. it in any direction. And you've got no yeah. context. You don't know where, where this fits in the story. They don't yeah. give you the name of the thing. Like, like wow. I remember really? when you're auditioning for something like Spider-Man or Star Wars, um, they they will not give it the same name. They won't tell you the role. They won't tell you the is that plot. That what happened when you auditioned for Mr. Fantastic. It's what happened when I auditioned for Aragon, actually, which is why. I, uh... <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, it, it it well as an actor, it's frustrating. It's like you're giving yeah. me nothing. Why did and they do also, that? And it's also by the way, usually a false scene is written specifically just for the purpose yeah. of the audition. So it's like so it's a little bit denuded of substance, and so yeah. it's just like mm. I'm trying to I'm trying to do what you want me to do. Yeah. And they give you a huge casting breakdown of describing a part of it, it's almost throwing every characteristic out there. Mm, right. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because you just don't really know what's going on. And they want to be like, so you want to be giving it this, but also yeah. this, and yeah. also this, and also but under there, yeah. a little bit of this. And then on top, you're sprinkling a little bit of this. And you're like, okay, all right, I think I can. But just throw it away. You're too invested. You're too invested. Just <laughs> Hold um, back just a little bit. <laughs> we want you more arrogant. That was too arrogant. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> yeah. But the but the reason and the reason why I was so hooked straight away is the scenes were so well written and so mm. thought out, and I got a really good understanding of who this person is, and I was very then I was keen to get involved. I then did a Zoom meeting, which is a Zoom screen test. It's the weirdest thing in the world because mm. you are. I was sat in a tiny room. And I got the sense it was about 50 people online. I couldn't see any of them. Apart from wow. John Scott, I think I could see. Ah, hmm. Shout out to John Scott. Shout out to John Intrepid Scott. Intrepid producing lovely director human. for season four. Mm. And, I mean, that seemed to go well. And then I had a lo lovely, uh, lovely lengthy chat with Sarah Gamble, and she gave me the whole precy of what was going to be taking place for the part. Okay, so that, that's what we were going to ask you next, probably, was, oh. uh, I think, right? If it is, is when when did you find out about, like, Reese's true nature? She basically told me everything. Mm -hmm. And I bricked it, because I was like, how on earth <laughs> am I going to, how, there was that pressure thing coming in yeah. again. I was like, how am I, I going to do that? Lot. 
How am I going to deliver? How am I going to find a way through to make this believable? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 I mean, I suppose it's very different if you're, all you've known is this show, but when you come into something yeah. that's such a juggernaut and is, yeah. has such like global viral following mm -hmm. with so many voices and opinions of what people like about it, what people, and what, character, what characters people respond to, yeah. inherently you cannot escape that in the, in the, in the, in the prep process. And I think, I know we talked quite a lot about where this storyline will sit and how people will respond to things later on down the line. And I think actually what's happening at the moment, now the first part is out there, mm -hmm. it's kind of playing out how we discuss. It's like people I think are a little bit like, people seem to be really enjoying it, but also going, yeah, well, what on earth is going on? Think about the twist that everybody thinks is the major reveal, which is that 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 Reese is a figment of Joe's imagination, yes. or at least that uh, that 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 the Reese who's killing people is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that that's the end of episode seven. Mm -hmm. You still got eight, nine, ten. Yeah, you still got you some still punch got of stuff. Mm -hmm. The cage, which is a huge reveal. Mm -hmm. Still got your directorial debut, which mm -hmm. is a major yeah. revelation. <laughs> we'll talk about that too briefly, yeah. Um, and you've got, I mean, yeah, you've got the bridge, you've got everything. So, so to me, I think the fact that people your have, reflection in the mirror, the final yeah, shot, yeah. yeah. Uh, do we know any? What's going on there? Do we know anything more? About, oh, about season five? Yeah. Uh, can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> um, no, actually, I have no idea. I, have, I literally yeah. have no idea. I actually don't. I mean, <laughs> He's backtracked so well on that one, isn't he? Is season like, five, Ed? Everyone wants you back. I, I mean, my personal feeling is that the writers have a major decision to make, which is yeah. like, are, is Reese along for the ride? Because uh, mm -hmm. it's a big decision either way. Yeah. So he, remember how hard it was on our schedule to shoot scenes where you are both there and not there mm -hmm. but there and not there i mean it actually made shooting everything it was like we didn't have that we didn't have it a lot a lot of the time it was mm. it was a phenomenal lift to do justice to how reese needed to be appearing mm. and like mm -hmm. and i and I, and i think but then if he's of course not there it's like well so what does that mean i mean i think i think i think they have a major decision before them with kate as well like mm -hmm. is she evil is she you know yeah wait, wait, what, which, they, which they, avenue do you pursue they've the reason i'm so easily able to say i have no idea is because i think they the writers um are are short of an official season five confirmation they just have to have the vapor the cloud forming in their mind but they you know they're not they're, yeah. You were the, basically three characters in one. There was the Reese Montrose, who was the mayoral candidate, who we saw giving speeches. There was the Reese author, who would, you know, chat with Jonathan Moore, get to know him, share similarities. And then there was Reese, Murderous. the alter ego of, of Joe. Um, and actually, the scene in episode seven, at the end of episode seven, where we, we realize that, you know, Penn has just castrated <laughs> Reese Montrose mayoral Joe. candidate. Mm. Joe. Oh, Penn, yeah. is it Penn? <laughs> Joe <laughs> has castrated. It's so hard to tell you guys Reese. apart yeah. so much in common. <laughs> That's the first time that, you, you know, there's two of you, you're two characters in one scene, and that was phenomenal. That was mm -hmm. incredible. Seeing you play Reese after we already know about the evil Reese, you know, um, you realize that those are two completely different characters. Mm -hmm. Although Sophie, to be fair, <laughs> yeah, at first thought... when you showed up in your suit, I thought, oh, he has a twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> I quickly I figured it out, but um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about your process? How did you how did you do that? Uh, I mean, that was probably that particular day. Ooh, that was a day. Was was probably one of the hardest of the shoot, but also. Yeah. It, again, because I like pressure, and I'm probably so into castration. Castration. <laughs> yeah. That's a personal was that, hobby was that of mine. Actually borrowed from retribution. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. Make me feel like I'm just like back to my high school days. <laughs> Make me feel like a little and boy. I've got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> Let's beat your body, shin, mate. This has been done once before, but it went really well. So. <laughs> it was. Uh, re re I passed my exam. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's a it's 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 a funny one because I remember leading up to that process, 
it, or the process to leading up to the to the day, it being, I was so fraught with concerns about how to deliver and how to execute that part because it, the advantage of once the cat's out the bag, I've I've really felt quite passionate about as much as there was always a lot of dialogue to get my head around, which I quite I actually really enjoyed doing that. I really liked the mm-hmm. the the muscular nature of of, of Reese's uh, vocabulary. Once the cat was out the bag, I felt that it was this huge liberty and mm. and, and, and this um, it was like a li- it was like a liberation. I was I, f- I felt I felt incredibly free in the process, which actually meant the final few episodes, although there was a lot to think about, I just felt I was able to explore and play. But in that moment, it, it, it's weird because I hadn't really had much of playing the the real Reese. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's true, actually. Yeah. And there's only three scenes, the real, yeah. and one of them is he's getting his balls chopped off. So, yeah. I mean... Yeah. But what a scene. Or tied, zip tied <laughs> off, actually. Yeah. Sorry. You know, let's, yeah. let's, let's get it right. Yeah. <laughs> Finished off. <laughs> Finished off, yeah. Um, but prior to that, there was only, like two, I think, two other scenes. Yeah. Maybe three. No, two. I think there's literally two, two, two scenes. And anyway, so he was trying to get the real version of him sort of mapped out was was quite tricky but i didn't mm. I, I also didn't feel i had to put too much difference because it wasn't until later on in the series once this the, this the, the revelation comes up that this whole new side of reese comes out because actually the reese you see communicating early on with mm-hmm. with joe jonathan is very in, in tune with with the real reese i yeah. suppose yeah, yeah. um I guess, I guess the difficulty was is, is actually how to place myself mentally in that state yeah. of being tortured mm-hmm. and what 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 that would be like and you know and you know what things i could find you know substitutions could i find in my own life you know what power of imagination i could use mm-hmm. and, and i will probably wax lyrical about this chap again because I, I have to say what i loved about our process for months right and you get it right from the off you know when you're in a scene with someone and you're like oh no this is going to be this is going to be a good experience because mm-hmm. a pen will always offer moments of levity and 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 humor he in does. day-to-day he life does. right he's really good at that because he's a fiercely intelligent i'm waiting for <laughs> free <laughs> <laughs> no but because i just felt that we we i think we had a really strong respect that's what i felt anyway for one another and what one another was trying to do and actually mm-hmm. we just trusted each other so when you get to a scene like like that it all comes down to trust, mm-hmm. and he's mm-hmm. so great to act against. You, there's, 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 it's not minimum requirement because that's lazy, and I don't think that's true. But you do, if you offer yourself over to someone who's going for it, mm-hmm. inherently, mm. something's going to work. Something's going to yeah. happen. And I, I was pretty invested in the story as well. I was, I got really, I, I was, I just felt there was there was something very powerful about these mm-hmm. two, and it was, and also it was turning. I don't know. I, I feel it's turned what the show has been on its head a bit. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, and I think does. that we've understood since season two that that kind of needs to happen in some manner every way. So when I was pitched this, the even the, 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 the barest bones concept of this sort of, this sort of partnership between two, between Joe and this like entity, you know, that was, I was like, that's uh, probably the, the best way to take it. Mm-hmm. And then when we started working together, I was really excited because of how, uh, how how invested you were in 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 like in like um well what were you just say you, you're just like you actually kind of made it fun i think in a way like it made joe fun which is really important actually mm-hmm. i mean it it because if we're able to have fun that means that means the audience is seeing something mm-hmm. different in joe that honestly i mean you only got shades of with uh with 40 played by james scully in in season two which was another like like a moment of an iconic pair it's like mm-hmm. you know we we have a, a a few of them throughout the series like just people that are great you gotta pair joe with somebody he can really go head to head with and that was it was such a joy those last three episodes in my memory were just so much fun and then i was also prepping to direct so it was like just the insane schedule so to me it the 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 first seven episodes are of a different completely different like universe for Mm -hmm. me than the last Mm -hmm. three where we got to be um a duo in that way and just and um yeah i don't know i just remember just you in your suit and just like (laughs) 
just just diving in and chewing up those monologues and mm-hmm. d- every take you were different i mean every take you were mm-hmm. you were you were different we were always trying to figure it out and i just like it's i just i just think it was brilliant it was, it was so fun to watch i have to say yeah. it was it was fun to watch met men it was so good to watch men <laughs> yeah <laughs> So fun to watch. That's another podcast. To watch, uh, <laughs> we've got three. Now, that's right, a good right. name for a podcast. Okay. Fun, men. Fun, no, fun to watch men. Yeah, that's a good name. A no, name. no visuals. <laughs> just, the, just the podcast. Um, so you were a character named Stephen Bonnet on a show called Outlander that was uniquely cruel to its two protagonists. I've I've never seen a show put put the two leads through so much, and I was just wondering when you have to play heavy characters like that, how do you get out of that mindset? I think it's impossible for it not to weigh on a little bit. It's, I mean, especially, I think it, it, certainly some of the subject matter that Stephen Bonnet was was a part of in Outlander, yeah, you, 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 it's hard to escape that. And I, I, I mean, it's something that you know, sexual violence is, I, I, it's, it's, again, coming back to having children and but in particular daughter and and, and mm. that 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 didn't sit well with me and it's mm. it's hard to decipher between what is telling the right thing narratively what is actually a really what, 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 are we achieving anything creatively from mm-hmm. here and i think as long as it's justified creatively i can get on with it but it does it does sit with me i think with i i, I enjoy playing villainous mm-hmm. parts I, I think however i d- I, I certainly strive, maybe, and then particularly with Reese, for, for them not to be too like pantomime esque. I, mm-hmm. I, I fear that sometimes they can be, and I've definitely been guilty of maybe them being that way. But I feel that with Reese, I really didn't want that. I really wanted it to be this this area of grey because you know that's that's humanity, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, they're pushed to extremes, but also, like, I mean, like he he. He Reese was a lot of fun to play, mm-hmm. and I and and we talk about confidence earlier on. I feel I get a lot more from playing those types of people because I I, I like trying to I I'm I am fascinated by trying to understand human behaviour and what mm-hmm. makes people tick and also what's led people to to be a certain way. I, it's tricky with Reese because obviously that version of Reese is a manifestation, but yeah. if you ground him in in what information I was given mm-hmm. about him and the real 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 version, it. it uh, yeah, I, I've 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 just always been I'm drawn to those to those characters, I suppose. But they do, mm-hmm. yeah. You do. There's always parts that are left, you know, lingering within you. I think mm. you have to. I mean, look. I guess also the advantage of this show, which I don't want me to do a disservice to the right team or anything like that. I just feel that although the issues it 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 uh, tackles head on. Are quite heinous. There's some pretty heinous acts take place. I feel, and this is why I think it's so popular. It it's done in a way that allows it allows levity and it, it allows yeah. it allows the audience the chance yeah. to go. I mean, this is really completely twisted and messed up and and beyond belief. It's, it's bananas. Yeah. It, yeah, it is totally. However, yet, we can get on board. We can go. Oh yeah. no, it's safe because it is so bananas and it is. There, there's a there's a. I feel there's a tongue in cheek element sometimes. There for absolutely sure, is, and sure. that's what I mean. Is I think your role was exceptionally difficult to find that balance. Yeah. You know, I really do, and I think you did an iconic job. <laughs> so I just want to commend you for that. Thank you. Um, and that's the final. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a real left turn here. <laughs> <laughs> Back to middle school because we're on a show called Mud Crush. Or it doesn't have to be say. What would you if you could visit your your twelve year old self again? What what would you do? Uh. I would say, trust yourself. Uh, believe in yourself a, a, a more. <laughs> I don't worry so much. I, I say, still say that to my nearly thirty-five-year-old self as well, because <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, I think those. It's, it's interesting. I know, that obviously, the, the topic of conversation is that you know age age group, but I feel that. I, I feel if someone had said that, I mean, and don't get me wrong, people did say it to me along the way, but I feel if I'd really believed in those things. Yeah, that's, mm-hmm. I think the question is evolving to become like, how does that person hear you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think if those messages had got through to me clearly, yeah, then I would look at the, look at myself differently. I'd, pre- I'd maybe appreciate myself a bit more. I think I constantly have that 
the battle of putting on a front of of backing myself and having a swagger around me, but you know, mm. the, the, you know, within it, it's not. And I think, yeah, I think I think just to just to trust yourself and believe yourself a bit more, believe in yourself mm. more, not worry, not worry about others as well, in the same way. I know we talked about empathy earlier on. I'm rambling. I'm always rambling. I'm so sorry. No. Well, we got to wrap it up. Well, now, you, right? truly uh, sorry. <laughs> you truly are a pen's match. Yeah. <laughs> just get those editing scissors yeah. in there. Yeah, we'll just, there was a full stop there at some point. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you've been so delightful. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Coming. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for, yeah. for, thank you for flying me out here. Yeah. <laughs> of course. First Taking class. Me away for time away from your family. <laughs> now let's make a TikTok. Yeah, yeah let's make a TikTok. <laughs> Two TikToks. One TikTok. <laughs> enough. It's not even like she's, <laughs> she's like, like. This is no, not no. even a joke. We're making no. two. We're, We're making two. two. We're making two. We're making two. Two, 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 two. Okay. You can catch Ed on Star Trek Picard season three out on Paramount Plus or on You season four out on Netflix. Yay! And you can follow him on Instagram at Edward J Spilliers. So I've just worked out my embarrassing story, and it's from today, whether this is usable, whether you think it's too much. I think I've just done that whole interview with my flies down, because I literally, unless they fell down during whilst we were doing the TikTok bit, but that's highly embarrassing as I'm saying goodbye to everybody. I noticed it, and my awkwardness and insecurity rose to the fore. So that was good.